good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you today. I um, have no conflicts of interest. What I thought I'd do is um, uh, focus on two areas that I think there's some new information that is worth reviewing. And um, one is um, nevus to melanoma progression I'm going to talk to you about. We are um, actively interested in delving in depth into this concept uh, in my laboratory. And two, um, some of the new findings on the role of UV radiation during uh, transformation. So for the residents, um, we do talk about melanocyte transformation, malignant transformation to melanoma. And um, what one thing we should think for the moment where are melanocytes, where the melanocytes located. Um, epidermal melanocytes on the skin, uh, or interfollicular melanocytes. We have melanocytes, the hair follicles. We have melanocytes in the uveal tract. We have melanocytes in the palms and soles, melanocytes in the subungual areas. And studies have demonstrated over the years that these melanocytes may be different and that the melanomas that arise from these melanocytes may be different. Um, and so one concept is the, in dermatology, we know that the majority of melanomas derive from de novo skin where there's no nevus or precursor lesion. And then another is the nevus or the dysplastic nevus progression to melanoma model. So I'm going to focus a little bit on this nevus to melanoma progression model. According to a number of clinical studies, um, there is a close link with nevi and melanoma. If we look at epidemiological studies, and these are very well done studies over the years that I'm referring to, not just one or two, melanocytic nevi are risk factors, meaning a single dysplastic nevus on the skin confers a twofold risk for melanoma. If you have more dysplastic nevi, and these are, could be clinically or histopathologically defined as dysplastic, but mostly these are clinically dysplastic nevi, 10 or more dysplastic nevi confer a 12-fold increased risk. So there's definitely this um, very solid information. So based on this information, a number of scientists have carried out GWAS, genome-wide association studies to see if they could find a single nucleotide polymorphism that could be linked to this phenotype. So what they've done is, basically we're talking about hundreds of patients where the DNA is sequenced, and you have one group of cases with lots of patients with lots of nevi, dysplastic nevi, patients with not very many nevi, and the concept is can we find a SNP that is associated with this phenotype? What is shown through these GWAS studies, and a similar thing has been done for melanoma. Cases with melanoma, cases no melanoma, are there SNPs? Patients with red hair, patients with no red hair. One thing that has we learned, and it's solid, is the MC1R um, polymorphisms, melanocortin receptor 1 polymorphisms are associated with red hair phenotype. That's very clear. There have been a number of publications looking and showing some of the SNPs in these genes I'm showing here that are solid, are not utilized, not validated, so I'm not sure of the validity of this as yet. It hasn't panned out as it has panned out for the, for example, the MC1R variants association with red hair phenotype. So we're going to put this NEVI as being risk factors and, and SNPs and the association aside for a moment, and then we'll go to NEVI as precursors. So we clinicians know, and you pathologists know very well, that um, many times we would have a melanoma, and next to the melanoma would be either a clinical nevus that clinically we can sometimes identify, or you can identify better, where there are nests of um, cells that are clearly nevus-like cells. So melanoma um, arising from a pre-existing nevus. Um, if we look at studies 
again, well done histopathology studies because clinically it's very hard for us clinicians. There are many, sometimes it's very clear that you can tell there's a neve as the melanoma develops, especially if you do a lot of um, um, dermoscopy or photography over time, you might be able to see there was a nevus and then now there's a melanoma rising from it. But clinically, it may not be easy to, for us to pick up um, the, this, but it, pathologically a lot more. So these are nice, well done histopathology studies showing 25% of melanomas with histologically associated nevi. This is a big number. It means one out of every four melanoma that we're seeing um, should be arising from a nevus. Now, I'll go into this a little bit more in depth. So I'm sure you would all agree with me. You've seen these cases. These are patients with what we would call typical classical dysplastic nevus syndrome patients where they have um, clinically these are, most of them are dysplastic nevi. Histopathologically, you would characterize them as dysplastic. Another way of looking at it is some, some clinicians refer to these as individuals with many nevi. And um, whether these are patients with dysplastic nevus syndrome or patients with many nevi have definitely a higher risk for developing melanoma. And then here are um, individuals with what we call congenital melanocytic nevi. And typical classification is at birth, these individuals have um, these nevi present. Um, not, it's not so much of an acquired phenomena. And what we also know is that the size, the load of the nevus associates with increased risk of malignancy. So a child with a giant congenital melanocytic nevus um, has a very high incidence of developing, risk of developing melanoma. Usually these melanomas develop within the first 10 years of age. Um, they are not necessarily obvious on the skin. They could be, there could be neurocutaneous melanosis. They could be developing in the deeper tissues, very tough. Um, cases for us to manage. Um, what do you do? Remove all um, skin um, melanocytes. They could be um, melanocytes in the deeper tissue. So I'm um, going to give you an example later on. Medium size congenital melanocytic nevi or a small congenital melanocytic nevi have some risk, but much lower than the large congenital melanocytic nevi. So um, we have learned through lots of sequencing studies, next gen sequencing studies. Uh, in terms of the major drivers or genetic drivers within these nevi and melanomas. Um, we have learned that these are, I'm showing you some very standard common acquired nevi, compound or interdermal, or they could be junctional. And the majority, and we're talking about really 80, 90% or so, have a BRAF activating mutation. Most of them are BRAF <coughs> 600 e mutations. Um, and the congenital melanocytic nevi, the very typical congenital melanocytic nevi where you see it at birth, 80, 90% or so um, NRAS mutations. Um, and blue nevi, GNAQ11 mutations, spitz nevi tend to have HRAS mutations. Um, dysplastic nevi, we've done some studies, patients like this, um, most of the time you'll see BRAF, sometimes we see RAS mutation. And what we have learned over lots of scientific studies is that um, nevi can transform into a melanoma, but you need other um, genetic events, most likely tumor suppressor loss, P16, P53, um, P10. This has been very well characterized over time. What I want to talk a little bit about what happens when we have a melanocyte that um, has a BRAF activating mutation or RAS activating mutation. There is a proliferative phase that these melanocytes proliferate. Um, so when we look at the skin, you would see the nevi would form. They would be small, one millimeter, two millimeter, and then at a four or five millimeter, they would stop growing. It doesn't progress beyond, meaning it doesn't transform into malignancy. But there's definitely a melanocytic proliferation. And um, individuals have looked, lots of functional studies have done. The concept is that um, a tumor suppressive mechanism of, the, um, of our system kicks in, and that basically an oncogenes induced senescence 
uh, machinery kicks in and these Nevi stops. So only you need other events so that you can bypass a BRAF and NRAS senescence event. So lots of active studies going on in this area. Um, what we have learned through, um, uh, this is a, a recent TCGA initiative led by Dr. Chen, published in Cell. Um, when we look at melanomas, and these are 400 melanomas that have been sequenced, so we're looking at the DNA level. Um, and I'm also, just to say, very glad that I'm in the melanoma field, not lymphoma. We keep classifications very simple. Um, we have about 52% of these melanomas with a BRAF mutation. We have 28% melanomas with a RAS mutation. And a um, small number, I think it's about 14 NF1, um, nerve fibromatosis 1 gene, it's a tumor suppressor, negative regular at the PI3 kinase. And then um, a fourth category called triple negative, you don't find any of these mutations. But um, BRAF and RAS mutations are typically not found together. They're mutually exclusive for the majority of cases, just because they activate the MAP kinase pathway, so no reason to have both. And, um, and um, so let me just go to the next step. So just to more to point out to you that um, there are four major categories. And again, we're looking at similar to a BRAF RAS um, clustering that makes me think is the concept that melanocytes um, transform without going through a nevus phase? Is that concept correct? It's just a question mark in our mind. Um, we clearly need other tumor suppressor events. That's already proven. So I want to give you an example of this um, patient. Our um, Durham resident Dan had this case and he said, you know, can you take a look at it? And pretty impressive case. A 46 year old man born with a giant congenital melanocytic nevus presents to the hospital with shortness of breath, pleural biopsy shows metastatic melanoma. So he is um, born with this nevus. This is a typical giant congenital melanocytic nevus. And let's examine a little bit. Um, here you have this big nevus and it's nevus stops here. You have another nevi. These congenital nevi typically have long um, hairs. Um, and then these are all nevi satellitosis. He has it in the acral site. He's pretty much everywhere. And um, I'm going to come back to this because we've sequenced this case a lot. Um, PET scan of this case showed hypermetabolic process of the lung parenchyma, mediastinum, lytic bone lesions. MRI of the brain did not show a mass. So he has stage four. He walks in with stage four disease. We can't find a primary. It's probably in the deeper component. And uh, pleural biopsy and skip biopsy confirm metastatic melanoma. We carry out uh, 50 gene pan, which Nina is going to talk about a little bit more. We pick up a RAS Q61K oncogenic mutation. So normally we would have predicted um, this mutation, but now we're confirming that this patient has um, RAS mutation. Obviously, we wouldn't put this patient on a BRAF inhibitor. He's targeted on immunotherapy. Um, but this patient reminded me of um, color code defects, um, what we call color code defects, and it's been pretty well characterized um, in a lot of um, initial work um, in the 90s, 2000, um, when individual scientists looked at pigmentary pathway alterations. So if we think about the, where the melanocytes and melanoblasts arise, they arise from the neural crest melanoblasts, and they basically migrate through dorsal lateral vent or ventral pathways. Um, and here is a um, mouse with a SOX10 mutation. Um, these are loss of function mutations. MITF um, mutation would give you a similar phenotype. PAX3 would give you a similar phenotype. These are um, genes important for a pigmentation pathway. And they are also important for survival of these melanoblast melanocytes during um, the migration. So what happens is the melanocytes migrate and they're differentiating as they're migrating, but if there's a loss of function mutation, they can't come and cul um, give pigment to this area. So they migrate, but they stop here. This is called a white belly phenotype. 
these are loss of function mutations, so they're not able to pigment. Wardenburg syndrome, for example, clinically, we see this phenotype in patients identically. So go back to our patient. And I actually had Glenn Merluna from the NCI, who's a mouse modeling expert, was visiting. I showed him this case. I said, this is what I think. What do you think? And he confirmed. So this is what we think. So the, clearly, this is the opposite of the white bella phenotype. So here, you know, the, he has normal skin as this. So his melanocytes have been able to migrate and pigment his skin entirely. There's no white belly. So there's no deep pigmentation. But he has a lot of pigmentation, a lot of melanocytic pigment genes proliferating. And, um, and then here, these are the satellitosis. So we think, you know, this case, we sequence it. They all, he has everything where he has RAS mutations, but more analysis is being done. It's highly likely in the neural crest, there is a subclone of melanocytes that have, are driven by the RAS mutation. Um, not so much. We don't think this case is going to have a germline mutation, but a subclone that gives this type of phenotype, and that's somatically driven. So again, think about this. I see a lot of these patients where they have lots of nevi, um, and you know, go back for a moment. That remind me of these nevi, where you don't have this big one, but many satellitoses, very symmetrical, and these are mostly RAS, BRAF driven. So it's possible that that we have, you know, more like a somatic um, BRAF driven mutations that are, might be developmentally um, relevant. So this needs to be proven, obviously. Um, we have um, also carried out a lot of sequencing of nevi. And we're, this is uh, going to be published. Um, again, we see these are dysplastic nevus patients. We see either BRAF or RAF mutations, mostly BRAF mutations. Um, when we look at the numbers of mutations in nevi, um, nevi have low frequency of mutations as compared to melanoma. Um, and, um, but they have UV mutation signature, which is going to make me switch to a little bit of giving you an update on UV radiation, what we've learned over the past year or two. Xeroderma pigmentosa, most of you know this um, clinical phenotype disease, first described in 1874. So we knew about the UV and melanoma link for decades and centuries, really. Um, we knew that patients with xeroderma pigmentosum recessively um, uh, inherit a disorder, have high risk for um, melanoma and um, uh, lentigenes. These patients have 10,000-fold increased risk of skin cancer, including melanoma, median age of skin cancer in these patients about age. So usually you wouldn't have a child with a lot of freckling unless they have a zero derma pigmentation phenotype. And you can see the sun protected areas don't have any lentigenes. And it's very unusual at age 10 to develop a melanoma or a basal cell, squamous cell. This is a um, condition, as we learn more in depth about this disease, we learn that these individuals have germline mutations in the um, nucleotide excision repair machinery. So this machinery is important to repair UV mutations. Whenever we're just walking around, it's a sunny day, we get a DNA lesion, a mutation, but our machinery repairs this effectively. If you do have a major um, a germline mutation where the genes coding for some of these critical proteins are not able to repair, you keep adding UV um, damage on top of another. So this is a patient of mine, doesn't have xeroderma pigmentosum, is an adult case, 50 years old, likes the sun, goes to Florida, and lays out in the uh, sun. And these are some nevi, so you don't have to have XP to give this kind of phenotype. What have we learned through next generation sequencing about UV and melanoma? So this is a study published in Nature a couple years ago, and many of these studies have been published right now. Um, showing the same um, results. So it's solid data. They looked at somatic mutation frequencies across cancers. So we look here, 3,000 tumor normal pairs. And um, here are the somatic mutation frequency. It's reported per MB, a little bit easier to report. For example, childhood tumors, AML, they have a medulloblastoma, you get about one mutation per MB. If you look at breasts, we have breast cancer, it's about 10 mutations per MB. Let's take a look. We have pancreas, about the same ovarian. Now, if we go all the way far right, 
the cancer that has the highest mutation load is melanoma. Um, hundreds of mutations per MB in melanoma. And that equates to 1,000 of mutation in the tumor. Second to melanoma is lung cancer. Again, you know, it's pretty high up. So one thought is two cancers that has the highest mutation rate that are associated with environmental carcinogenesis. One UV, the other is with um, lung, um, smoking. What they also looked at, they looked at nucleotide um, at the nucleotide level, and they looked to see CTT transition enrichment. If you have a CTT mutation, this is indicative of UV signature. So if you just follow the yellow here, as you can see, right all the right way on the right, melanoma has the highest CTT mutation. So it's another, now we have more genetic evidence of um, UV mutation and mutation load in melanoma, somewhat confirming our original clinical findings or observations. So again, in melanoma, we would like to keep the classification very simple. Um, we um, talk about cutaneous melanomas arising from um, epidermal melanocytes, follicular melanocytes, mostly driven by BRAF or RAS mutations. Um, acral melanomas um, rising from palm soles, subungual sites, um, they tend to have either kit mutations or amplifications. They can have BRAF RAS mutations, but there's a, a big, like about 15 to 20 percent frequency of kit mutations or amplifications in acral melanoma. If you just look at cutaneous melanomas, you would only pick up about 3 percent kit mutation frequency in, in this group. Um, uveal melanomas, GNAQ11 mutations, um, BAT1 deletion, again, mucosal melanoma enrichment of kit mutations is about 15 to 20 percent. Um, what we've learned again is um, if uh, we sequence melanomas from sun exposed sites, um, the mutation load is high. In this paper, 171 mutations per tumor. And then in sun shielded areas, it's about nine. So definitely there's a um, nice correlation that we're showing that mutation load correlates with sun exposure characteristics. I'm going to briefly go over our sun exposure behavior over the past. Um, century or two. So it's thought that our sun exposure behavior changes in the 1920s, 30s, and Coco Chanel, a French de designer, has um, significant influence in our behavior. I like her fashion. Um, a milky skin seemed a sure sign of aristocracy. So this is uh, 1800s, early 1900s. If you look at books, movies, women are covered head to toe in a way. That's the fashion. They have a hat. They have an umbrella when they go out. You don't see women with a tan. It was only the workers outside were okay, allowed to have a tan in a way. So this was the type of look. We, they didn't go to the beach, vacations. This is 1800s, early 1900s. Um, Chanel, she's a um, very influential person getting very um, successful in her business. Um, women try to do whatever she does. So she's smoking. They don't know the exposure of um, smoking, um, the risk for smoking at the time. Women start smoking. Um, she's spending, she has an active social life and she's spending a lot of time in yachts. She comes, works out with a 10. So she you know, um, gets her Chanel number no. five perfume out. Women start tanning according to history, not sure how it is, but she seemed like she influenced somewhat. The look of having a sun, sun tan was okay. It was not necessarily, um, it, it was okay to have a look like that. Claude Monet, and you can see the behavior here, some behavior. We have a hat, long uh, dresses, we have an umbrella. Um, early 1900s, the um, sun exposure behavior changes. We start going to the beach. And we lose the hats, we're at the beach more and more. Cancer statistics just published, American Cancer Society. Um, melanoma of the skin, um, this is from 1975 to 2011. Um, this is in men. It's steadily increasing. This is the incidence. What we also know is, unfortunately, mortality in men is increasing as well. And this is a problem we're trying to educate and uh, men how to prevent uh, skin cancer. Um, women also increasing, but the really biggest increases in men, especially in the um, 
in terms of the mortality rate. If you look at bladder, it's pretty stable, going down, lung going down here, unfortunately, lung cancer is going up in women. And I took um, a few notes um, from the American Cancer Society's report. So currently, cancer is the second leading cause of death in the U.S. It is expected to surpass heart disease as the leading cause of death in the next few years. We have a total of uh, 1.6 million new cancer cases, about 589 uh, cancer deaths. Melanoma deaths that are about 780,000 in the United States. So um, cancer, the incidence frequency is about equivalent to uh, 4,500 new cancer diagnoses each day. And this is of interest about 60,000 cases of female breast carcinoma in situ and 63,000 cases of melanoma in situ or diagnosis. So melanoma in situ is catching up, unfortunately, with breast in situ. Um, skin cancer is the most common cancer. I'm going to stop here. Thank you.